We're over the moon to welcome a wonderful guest that we have admired for a long time here at Happerful to kick off season 10 of I Am, I Have. Acclaimed mind coach, co-founder of The Rising Circle, and author of the Sunday Times bestsellers, Good Vibes, Good Life, Healing is the New High, and now the beautifully written and perspective shifting Closer to Love. Welcome, Vex King. Thank you so much for having me. That's such a lovely intro. The pleasure and privilege really is all ours to have you here. We have a tradition on this podcast of asking our guests to fully introduce themselves in their own words and to tell our listeners what's important to them. So Vex, what would you like our listeners to know about you? I like to just call myself the guy that tries to make the world a better place or spread positive energy. Unfortunately, that doesn't really give clarity on who I am and what I do. I'm an author, so my latest book, Closer to Love, has just come out, and that's my third book. And ultimately, I'm spreading a message of self-love. I've come from a place where I endured a lot of suffering. To give a little bit of background, my dad died when I was six months old. My family and I were homeless for roughly three years of my childhood. And then when we finally found home, Unfortunately, we weren't quite welcome in that particular area, that neighborhood. And for at least, well, it'd probably be two decades, I suffered a lot of poverty, and I would say severe poverty, racism, abuse. And uh, there was a lot of times where I suppose I I nearly gave up on myself, on my life. Um, I just wanted a, a, a kind of a way out. Eventually, you know, I I turned to books and books really helped me. They really built in hope that there was something better out there for me, that I could change my mindset and I didn't have to be a victim of my circumstances. Now, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't wish anyone to go through what I did, especially as a child. At the time, it was traumatic and I didn't realize it. It was it was painful. It was heartbreaking and it was uncomfortable. But at the same time, I look back on it now and say to myself, would I be here if I hadn't gone through those particular things? Would I have a story to tell, a story that inspires other people, a story that encourages hope in other people? Would I have gone out my way to find these tools, these ideas, these perspectives that have altered my life and that I'm now sharing with the world so people can change their own lives? So although... I'm a writer or just a writer or a guy that's trying to spread positive energy. I'm trying to do it in a way that's relatable, accessible, and also digestible. Because I know having read so many books around personal development, spirituality, and so forth, some things sound amazing, especially on paper. They sound poetic, sound flowery almost. And you think, wow, that's amazing. And You know, it kind of touches your heart to some extent. But then you think to yourself, well, how do I apply that in my everyday life? How does it move beyond maybe a a nice tattoo that you have on yourself? How can you actually take that wisdom and make it a part of your own story? How do you create change? And that's what I try to do with my writing and my work. I'm not trying to tell people that my ideas are the only way. And I think if you genuinely care about the well-being of people, you would never enforce your beliefs, your ideas, your way of doing things on other people as the ultimate truth. Because as we know, there's a range of healing modalities out there. There's a range of experts out there. There's a range of avenues that you can follow or go down to help you. And it doesn't matter which one helps you and serves you. It just matters that it does. And that's ultimately, I think the most important thing, especially in this space of personal development, mind, body and spirit, it's finding something that works for you. And I just hope that my work at least helps some people out there. Thank you for sharing all of that. And your work absolutely does help people and continues to help people. And you mentioned about Closer to Love. And I just wanted to take a moment to say, what you do really is accessible. And it really does hit home in so many different ways and although the title is closer to love I want everyone to know that this isn't necessarily about romantic love it's about the fact that if you can start to look at your relationship with yourself 
with self-love, then so much flows from that. And I wondered if you wanted to share a bit about the book before we get into your I am's and I have. Thank you so much for that. You've basically told everyone the core message of the book and it's absolutely spot on. So closer to love, when you hear the word love, I think a lot of the time we think of romantic love. And although the narrative, I think, supports a lot of notions around romantic love, love is expressed in our lives in so many different ways. We can find love everywhere we turn, whether it's pets, family, children, poetry, art, other forms of literature, Love's everywhere. And what I wanted to do with Closer to Love, instead of telling people what to do in their relationships, I've made suggestions, but ideally the main point of the book is to give you enough clarity and self-awareness so you can make the best decisions for you. And to do that, we have to return home to our own hearts. When we return home to our own hearts, We know what's best for us. We know who we are as people, our identity, our individual personalities, our likes, our dislikes, our values, our dreams, our goals, our needs, our expectations. And only then how we find someone that's truly compatible for us. Also, when we return home to our heart, we realize that some parts of our heart might be a little bit in the shadows, maybe because there's been a little bit of self-neglect. So we begin to shine light on those areas. And that then makes us better partners when we step into relationships because we are no longer wounded from the things that we have experienced in the past. And it's very important to know that we've all been wounded to some degree. As soon as we step out of the house, it's almost like, how can I go through the day, not only to succeed or achieve a goal or do what I need to do, but not let the world around me make me turn cold because everything around you could be triggering. It could be someone that makes a comment or someone that jumps the queue or cuts you up in traffic. And every single thing we take almost as, I don't know, something that that hurts us. And it's very difficult to then not act on the pain that we experience. And so returning home to your heart will help you heal from the things that you've experienced in the past, the things that you might have suppressed, potentially emotions that you've suppressed in the past. And that will make you a better partner. But ultimately, returning home to your heart will create self-acceptance. It will help you accept the parts that you've neglected, the parts that society might have told you weren't nice or beautiful, that weren't okay. And when you begin to accept yourself and you step into a relationship, and that's any type of relationship, you see other people in their humanness. You see them with their quirks, their likes, their dislikes, their preferences, their flaws or subjective flaws, shall I say, and you're able to accept them. So it really does come down to building a healthy relationship with yourself because you'll know who's right for you or who's a good match for you you'll be able to heal. So you're not passing pain patterns on because a lot of the time what happens is, and it's unconscious, but someone passes pain to us because they're hurt. And then that hurt gets passed on to another person. And this cycle of hurt perpetuates around the world. And suddenly we're so far from compassion and we're just creating more hurt in the world. And finally, it creates that that acceptance. And when you have that acceptance, you're able to hold space for other people. You invite them to be vulnerable in a safe space because you know that you've been vulnerable with yourself. You've faced up to your own demons, to your own darkness, although darkness really is just an outcome of light. If you think about a shadow, a shadow is only present because there's a source of light somewhere. So really it all falls under the umbrella of light. But a lot of the times we've just been conditioned or we've just learned to dislike certain parts of us, but those parts actually make us beautiful. And as cliche as that may sound, we're we're only human and we're all trying our best. So yeah, that's essentially the, the kind of the core message of Closer to Love. And if anyone manages to pick up a copy, I really do hope it helps you because it is beyond love and relationships. Although that's the kind of niche audience or the niche topic, it's really about coming home to yourself. But when you do that, I can almost guarantee that your your whole life will improve. Honestly, I think it, it hits home on so many different levels. 
And you just come up with very simple prompts for people to think about their life, think about their experiences, perhaps moving on to a new relationship. What are you taking forward? And just some really beautiful, beautiful sayings in the book that really resonate. Like love is found in the simple moments and self-love doesn't require a partner. And one that I thought was really beautiful, which is rejection can be seen as an invitation to love yourself more. And it's absolutely true. Before I met my wife, and I've been with my wife for 14 years, we've been married for five of those years, but we've been together, you know, since we were young. And before we actually met each other, both of us had experienced heartbreak. And both of us almost said to ourselves that we weren't interested in other romantic relationships, that we wanted to focus on ourselves, find ourselves, because... And I'm sure anyone that's gone through heartbreak and you don't often hear it from men as much because we've just been taught to be like these, you know, tough individuals who just push everything to the side and get on with the world. But, you know, those things do, they skew your perspectives. They make you feel broken. And, you know, although the heart actually never physically breaks, it it emotionally feels like the heart's shattered into pieces. And you do lose your sense of self-worth, I think, a lot of the time. There's these limiting beliefs, maybe, that you weren't good enough, that the idea of love is completely flawed and it doesn't exist. And it really makes you lose your sense of self in the world, I think. And after that severe heartbreak that I experienced, I really wanted to discover myself again. I really didn't want to be the product of the pain that that particular heartbreak had caused. And my wife, Koshal, she was on on the same journey and we just managed to kind of meet naturally and you know although I said to myself that I, I was I didn't want to be in a relationship at this time although I had been doing the work already and she had been doing the same it just felt natural we just kind of gravitated towards each other so the pain actually can be a catalyst for self-growth to find happiness on your own. So when you do choose to be in a relationship with someone that's worthy of your your time and energy and matched effort, you're not creating a codependent relationship with that person where you're trying to use the other person to fix gaps in your self-esteem or fill voids within yourself. But actually, you're enjoying the relationship and you're co-creating happiness together. You're on this journey side by side, and it's not you two fusing into one and then losing your sense of autonomy. It's you two as individuals cultivating this love together, creating this happiness together, but still moving in the same direction with shared goals. And it can be a a very beautiful thing. That is beautiful. And that co-creation of happiness and a life together. And before we finished temporarily on Closer to Love, I did just want to give a shout out to your dog who you've dedicated the book to. You mentioned the purity, the pureness of love that you Mm -hmm. found from having your dog. My dog's actually named after a rapper that some of you might be aware of called Tupac. And I'll actually give you the story of that because a lot of people ask me, like, why did you call him Tupac? So I grew up listening to to rap and hip hop music and I I lived a very troubled life. And listening to Tupac's music kind of validated a lot of the emotions I was experiencing as a very troubled teenager. And I saw this softness in Tupac, although he had this kind of hard edged persona in the media and he was screaming all kinds of stuff. I admired that he was authentic raw, intelligent, but inside, all he really wanted to do was share love with the world. And that was through his music. And I saw that softness and I felt the same because although I had to kind of toughen up because I was the man of the house from age six months old, I knew that inside, ultimately, everything was about love for me in my life. It was the love of my mom and my sisters that kept me going. It was the love of the people around me that really, you know, helped me progress when during times where I wanted to to give up. And I saw that in Tupac. So when we got a uh, toy poodle, you know, I saw this softness in, in him. And I was just like, I, w- I want to call him Tupac because it can, this seems like there's a bit of irony in the name, but actually it represents him because, so Tupac had this saying called thug life, I know, which sounds quite aggressive, but we've changed Tupac the toy poodles to hug life <laughs> because he gives the, the, the best hugs. But honestly, I've never had any pets before. And my wife was 
obsessed with dogs and for a 30th we decided well I decided that I would you know get, get a pet that we would get a, a pet as a, as a family and he's entered our life and honestly I don't know how to describe it it's just he he really transforms our house into a home it's just this pure unconditional love they don't hold grudges they won't stay angry at you I don't even know if they can express anger it's almost like their whole purpose in life is to make you happy and I just thought to myself Imagine if every single person could love to that capacity in the world, how beautiful would the world be? Because a lot of the time, the wars, the differences, all the things that go on that create separation in the world is actually not because of hate, but it's because of non-love. It's because we don't see the connectedness between us and our neighbours and everyone else around us. But the dogs, they don't discriminate. They see you as just a soul, a human. They don't see me as a, you know, a, a brown man. They don't see me, you know, they don't see gender. They don't see anything. They don't see my flaws. They just want to offer love. And I just think, how beautiful is that? So that's why the the book's dedicated to my, my pet dog. I'm glad we got an opportunity to talk about that. And that love is just precious, isn't it? And it's pure. So we're going to head on to your I am's. And your first is, I am kind, compassionate and caring. Tell us a bit more about being kind and compassionate and caring. When I was younger, I, I probably wasn't as kind and compassionate and caring as I was. Um, right now, the reason I know I'm compassionate is because I can show my younger self that compassion. I know I wasn't kind to everyone before. I know I may have hurt people in the past, you know, including people in my own family when I was triggered or upset. I was raised by a single mum. I was in neighbourhoods where I was rejected for my race. I've seen, you know, my uncle, my auntie, my mum, my sisters beaten by thieves. I've seen a gun to the head of my, my uncle. Um, all of those things you download into your, almost like your psyche, into your being, and it makes you a certain way. And a lot of the times I was angry with the world, but that anger was just a secondary emotion. The primary emotion was pain. I was experiencing pain. And to deal with that pain, I, sh I showed anger. And when I showed anger, I started wrecking the world around me. Um, and I know that now and I'm compassionate towards that version of me because I know I lacked support I lacked education um I didn't always have you know my mum was was busy working a lot of the time to to make a you know a living um to put food on the table so it was a difficult time for me and over the years what I've re realized is that you know people say treat people how you want to be treated but i've kind of reframed that in my mind and i've said treat people better than you've been treated because i've been treated very badly in my life by those people that told me to you know get out of the neighborhood return home <laughs> to my 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 co home country which was actually the uk you know i was born born here to the people that abused me manipulated me to my uncle that hurt me as a child, to all the people that hurt me, I know how it feels. And I think every single human being in this planet has been hurt to some degree. And if we want to make the world a better place, we have to remember that, especially when we're fueled with these heavy emotions, such as anger or despair or rage, it's to take a moment and step back and say to yourself, if I act on these emotions, how am I then creating more pain in the world? I always thought being kind of this hard edged, rough man is the way to be. And that takes strength, but actually kindness to me requires strength. It's so much easier to react on your emotions, then to pause, take a step back, encourage some self-awareness and respond to your emotions in line with how you wish to see the world in the future. And that's what I've kind of trained myself, I suppose, over, over the years. And I can truly say, and obviously to some people, especially if you're unaware of my background and 
you know, the things I've kind of left behind to do what I do now. Um, this might sound <laughs> a little bit egotistic, I suppose, but I can honestly say that I do truly care about people. I can truly show compassion towards people and that I am truly as kind as I can be, not to say that I'm perfect. There's going to be moments, but I do try to keep kindness, compassion and care at the forefront of my mind. And I, I do try to act in line with kindness, compassion and care at all times. I can really hear that in everything that you've said and talking about the way you grew up and some of the circumstances around your childhood and, and early teens. It's quite immense that you are able to put that gap in, that pause in, because mm -hmm. that's something that takes, as you said, a lot more strength than reacting mm -hmm. is being able to take that moment, especially when you're in pain or you have felt pain in the past. How did you learn to put that gap in between reaction and pause? The most important thing, I think, for anyone that especially struggles with that is to assign yourself an amount of time and try and stick to it. I think I did 15 seconds or something like that. It was really simple at the start. So, for example, something's happened in my life and old Vex wants to shout and scream or break something. And before I do that, I'm, I'm aware that these emotions are rising to the surface and I'm not trying to suppress them. I'm not saying I don't want you here because I think when you do that and you resist the emotion, that actually creates the discomfort. It's the resistance of the emotion which really sends you through the roof. So I, I notice them and I know they're rising and I can see them. And then... I think to myself, I'm going to act in this way because these emotions feel so heavy to me. And when I think that thought, I say to myself, wait, that is going to create more difficulty for either the person that's involved, the event or for myself. So I need to pause and I'll just pause for 15 seconds. Notice the emotions and just say, OK, one, two and literally count to 15. And I can honestly say when you count to 15, all the emotions might have not completely subsided, they do start to slowly dissipate. So start with just 15 seconds and try not to engage with the thing that's triggered you within those 15 seconds. Even if it's a person, what you can kindly do is say to the other person, I don't want to say anything in this particular moment because I feel like if I do, I may say something that I regret later. So please allow me X amount of time and then I will return to you. And from that 15 seconds, I took it to 15 minutes. And a lot of the time in those 15 minutes, what I would do is I'd go for a walk. I'd be outside in nature because I feel nature's very rejuvenating. I don't think unless you catch a cold when you go out for a walk, I don't think many people regret walks. I think they can be wonderful or unless something, you know, really... Um, really traumatic happens, like you get robbed or something, which has, a, you know, there's a very slim chance. And hopefully we live in safe neighborhoods, but I don't think many people regret walks. But I go out for 15 minutes, I disengage with the things that have triggered me or the thing that has triggered me with people. And sometimes it's nice if you, if it's something else, like, for example, at work that's triggered you and you have a supportive partner, it's sometimes nice just to go on a walk with your partner because you know they will offer you this kind of unconditional support and love and that can be very healing itself I think but it's just to disconnect from the environment that's triggered you and then take a moment for yourself recollect your thoughts keep your energy grounded and go back after 15 minutes and see if you react in the same way as you might have in that particular moment and I can almost guarantee you won't because you've had time to let those emotions subside. You've now managed, hopefully in that time, to challenge some of the narratives that might have been playing. If someone does something to you, for example, let's say you're out shopping and someone knocks into you and your initial reaction is just like, why have you knocked into me? And you're say you're already having a bad day. So now 
you know, your day is bad. You, the, the, the baseline isn't that great. Your initial reaction might be like, you've done that on purpose and how could you? And now if you take the pause, what you get to do in that time is you get to get to challenge the narrative that's playing on your mind. And you start to question what's assumption and what's fact. The assumption is they did it on purpose. Unless they've told you they did it on purpose, you don't know that they've done it on purpose. So that's a fact that the assumption that you're making is wrong because there's no truth behind it. And when you start doing that and you start challenging those narratives, you actually realize that sometimes a lot a lot of the times our minds are stretching things out of proportion and they're being quite ludicrous. And the reason they do that is because our conditioning set in a certain way. Maybe we've had similar experiences in the past and they distort what's happening in the present moment. And what we experience in the present is a result of what we've experienced in the past. Sorry. And that's obviously not always accurate. The other thing then you can do is if you're going to make assumptions, you can also assume that they're going through a bad day themselves or maybe something else has happened in their lives and we need to show them some more some grace or compassion so if you're going to assume why not assume the best rather than assume the worst because when you assume the best it's going to elicit more positive feelings but if you assume the worst it's going to elicit kind of negative uncomfortable and desirable feelings I appreciate you sharing that so much because it's something we can all do. It's not something that is outside of any of our grasp. And also just remembering that everyone's a human being that experiences the same challenges and not everyone's been exposed to the same privileges you may have been exposed to. And I say this as a man that's had a very tough upbringing. And I can still say that just being in England, I still have privileges compared to someone in a third world country. Being homeless in this country at that time still came with privileges as compared to maybe my mum's home country, India, or my dad's home country, Uganda. I think it's it's always good to remember that people... And I don't mean to sound woo-woo, but I think everyone is, is born loving. And over time, we've just been taught to disconnect from that love because of all the pain and heartache that we've experienced. And that can be a result of the circumstances, the things that we've been exposed to very early on in life. Like orphans don't choose to be orphans. They don't choose that life. They're too young. But unfortunately, not everyone's given the same circumstances, the same opportunities in life. And that's not to say you can't change your life around. It's just to have hold that compassion. If you can't hold true empathy because you've not experienced the same things, you can always show compassion and understanding. And that's what I try to do with people to the best I can. And I think maybe it's because I've conditioned it in myself. And I've trained it myself and I've done it so often that I can do it more naturally. Or maybe it's just because I take a more wholehearted view of myself and I'm able to then, you know, do that with other people as well. And that's interesting what you're saying there about other people and, and privilege and sharing that message about compassion. And it speaks to your next I am, which is I am doing my best to alleviate suffering in the world. You tell us a bit more about that and perhaps rising circle as well. My work is inspired by the young Vex that didn't have ways to leverage, that didn't have resources, that didn't have people around him who encouraged his dreams. When I asked people around me if there was a better life for us, because mind you, you know, I was living in a, a council estate that was didn't always do well with or did very well with crime. Um, but you know, that wasn't full of opportunity. Everyone around me was experiencing the same kind of challenges in just different family dynamics. And if I spoke to them about being this author or, you know, traveling the world or even visiting like the Maldives, for example, on a luxury holiday, they would tell me that I'm completely crazy and I'm out of my mind. And I heard that a lot in in my life growing up, that this is your reality. This is the life for you. And, you know, you'd have some people that followed a certain religion. So they would say, God has given you this life and it's for a reason, which obviously it sounds great to start with. But, you know, you're, this is the life you're supposed to live. And I wasn't quite fond 
of that answer. And I wasn't fond of the things I had to experience on a daily basis. I woke up a lot of the time and I actually said to myself, this is another day in hell. And I remember thinking this as a child, thinking, why do other kids get to enjoy their lives and be happy? Whereas I have to think about how I'm going to survive this day, how I'm going to potentially smile this day, how am I potentially going to have food this day? Like, why do I have to struggle so much? And so for me, I wanted to share the lessons I learned as a child with the world. But more importantly, a lot of my passion and drive has grown from this desire to to help people or to prevent people almost from going through the same suffering I did. A lot of people turned to me for advice when I was, even when I was younger. And it was a little bit strange that people would come to me, even though I was completely lost in the world. And I actually felt the most alive when I was advising people. I always wanted people to do well. Like I'm one of those people, even when we had like PE in school, And if I wasn't playing in the game, I'd be on the sidelines and I've been trying to motivate my team. And I'd be like, look, we can we can do this. We can win. And even my PE teacher once turned around to me and he said, I can see you as a coach in the future because you're just so passionate. And I was passionate because I was kind of passionate about getting away from pain and failure because that's all I was experiencing in my life. And that I think that comes across in my work It's me trying to do the best I can with the tools I have, with the expertise and ideas that I have learned over the years and just sharing them with people and hoping that they can alleviate some of the suffering in their own lives. And when we create the Live Rising Circle, so it's a, it's a small company right now that we've created, so my wife and I, and we've got a small team. We wanted to share wellness tools, techniques, different modalities, things that are quite practical, things that are quite esoteric, things that are, you know, kind of out there potentially, but just wellness tools that will support people on their own journeys. And the key idea is, is not to impose any of these things on you and say, like, you must do this. It's to be like, try this out. And if it helps, amazing. We wish you all the best. So, you know, continue using it and and, and see what happens. But at the same time, if it doesn't, that's okay maybe this is for you maybe that's for you or maybe none of this is for you and that's okay too a lot of people would message us and say they struggle with meditation and I think it's one thing that a lot of people can relate to that meditation is pretty difficult especially because there's so many different types of meditation and when you try it and if your mind's overactive I think our own mind can be such a hindrance that we get almost put off meditation we also realize that in the world that not only is there a lot of poverty that there's the cost of living and in the UK which is supposed to be a really secure country cost of living is really, really high. People have struggled over COVID, businesses shut down. um, And a lot of them were small businesses that had potentially just even started. I thought to myself, there's so many meditation apps and they offer like one or two meditations, but after a while you have to pay a subscription. And the last thing you want now in the world is more subscriptions just so you can look after yourself. So my wife and I said, let's invest in in some guided meditations on YouTube that we will offer to people for free. So they don't have to pay any money. At worst, they might have to watch a YouTube ad at the beginning of the video. But let's create all different types of meditations because meditation for me has changed my life. And for my wife, she's always struggled with meditation. So we put all these meditations out on our YouTube channel on The Rising Circle, along with our Instagram channel. uh, We've got this small community and we share different ideas from astrology, yoga, philosophy, modern spirituality, new age and traditional and so forth. And it's just really taking what's helpful for you and using it to support yourself in your in, in your journey. As we started really thinking about what we wanted to do with the writing circle and how we see it progressing, we put the question back to our audience, like what, what else do you struggle with? How else can you be supported on your journey? And a lot of people said they struggle with journaling. In my mind, it was simple. Like, you know, you can just open up a, a, a diary or a notepad and just start writing how you feel, or your thoughts or whatever comes to your mind. But actually that's not for everyone, it's very difficult. And I've journaled, well, I didn't label it journaling at the time because it wasn't even this this thing, I suppose, in the past. But I'd always penned my emotions or I'd always wrote down how I felt growing up. 
I don't think I'd be a writer if I hadn't, because I was being being very vulnerable with myself on paper. And even as a writer now, I do the same thing. I'm very vulnerable on paper. So although I like to share research and science and studies, essentially, I'm talking about my own life and experiences, and I'm sharing my story. And it's really helped me understand myself. It's helped me understand my emotions. And that's why I say in the journal, and I've said it online in the past, is that journaling is your avenue to emotional literacy. It's a great way to understand yourself. So my wife told me what she struggles with when it comes to journaling. And I told her how journaling benefited me. And the key thing I think for me was that I gained all this self-awareness. And that's what a journal should do. So we came together. And although I'm going to be a little bit biased, I would say that the, the the journal that we've created, it, it's called The Greatest Self-Help Book Ever Written, is the one by you, because I truly believe that. Not to downplay my other books, but I truly believe that the, the book that you engage with, the book that you get to know yourself with, is going to make the biggest difference in your life. And this book, this journal truly, truly does that. It gives you prompts every single day, and they're, they're always different prompts. They're things you might have not thought about before. Those questions will have you soul searching. When people say the answers are within, it sounds cheesy a lot of the time, but it's so true. But to get to the answers, you need questions that will lead you to those answers. And that's what the journal does. What was beautiful when you were talking about that is I could see how much joy it brings you. And when you were talking about working with your wife and and also looking at what works for people and what doesn't work for people. I kind of had a vision of young Vex again on the on the sidelines in PE cheering people on. And that is obviously something that continues to fill your cup in a way. Oh, thank you. It really does. I think when I tell people that I get excited by seeing people win, sometimes they might turn to me and say, well, surely do you not get a little bit competitive, like with book sales or, you know, followers or something. And I'm like, no, like it inspires me. I'm inspired by not only the people at the top and whatever you define the top to be, I get inspired by the people that are just overcoming the daily challenges of life because they're difficult. And I just want people to do well. And my If my aim or my goal is world peace, then why would I want someone to feel sad or not to feel their goals or not to be happy? Because then that is just going to burden other people or themselves. Like, you know, if you truly mean that, you know, you want to alleviate suffering, then the way to that is to, to have individuals who feel more at peace with themselves, that feel happier, that have achieved success in whatever way way that looks like for them that's why it's so exciting for me to help people and it's such an honor I take this role very seriously I suppose I don't you know I often get called a guru and a teacher and those labels are great I mean they sound fantastic but honestly I, I, I like to remind people that I'm just a normal human being that's gone through some stuff that's just trying his best again to alleviate suffering in the world This just dovetails beautifully with your third and final I am, which is about being authentically empowering. And you were talking about well-being in the wellness space. And in terms of being authentically empowering in the, I hate to say well-being space because it sounds kind of industrial in a way, but I think that authenticity is so important. Can you tell me why that's so important for you to be able to empower people in a way that's authentic? I'm going to put it this way. I looked up to a lot of, and I still do, I look look up to a lot of people. And growing up, I was desperate for a way out of my life, right? Because, you know, it was, it was, again, I keep saying this, but it was very painful. It was, mm. there was parts of it that were horrifying. Even when I didn't have a lot of money, and that was most of the time, actually, I would sometimes use the little money I had on teachers or people that could potentially help me people that over promised they said they could help me with my life they could provide healing they could make my dreams come true and because I was so vulnerable I was in such a vulnerable place sometimes those people would prey on me I think and I would use that money to only be manipulated to almost be taken advantage of. And that was very hard for me at the time, because it made me believe that 
no one's good out there in the world and that no one actually wants to no one actually cares about people all they care about is filling their their, their pockets and their their bank balance and i've kind of emerged on this scene and like you know like you say it sounds quite industrial when we talk about the wellness space but i'm just this normal guy that's that's come on the scene and you know people say he's sold a million books and he must be this and he must be that um although I wanted to reach so many people I've always and you'll see it on my Instagram page you you'll rarely find a picture of myself because my aim is not to be famous and it's not even to be rich and I'm not saying that money doesn't help because money does help and it's to me it's merely energy and it you know we all have bills to pay and I know that more than anyone because I've grown up in poverty but (laughs) I always put people and purpose before profit and popularity. And what I learned about this world is that some people do it the other way around, but package it as people and purpose comes (laughs) first. And it wasn't until I got into this kind of, again, space and I met some of my idols And I realized that a lot of it was very performative. And I know no one can ever be who they are exactly online or on camera or on stage, because in a way it is kind of like a performance, I suppose. But it's important to carry as much authenticity and integrity into those roles as possible. Because when you're only performing, not only are you being disingenuous, you're mis- and, and misleading people, You're telling people indirectly that to be accepted or to succeed in society, you have to be someone else. And that shows in this world right now, you go on Instagram, you go on TikTok, people are screaming for validation, but that validation is just, please accept me, please like me, please love me, please acknowledge me. People want to feel seen. They want to be heard. And there's all these leaders at the top that are misleading so many people and saying, you know, be yourself, but are they even being themselves? In this space for myself, I'm enticed by all kinds of things like, Vex, you should do this, you should do that. We'll offer you X amount of money. Do you want to be famous? We can put you on TV and have your own show and, and so forth. And it's, I always have to kind of reel myself back in and say, like, what would be the benefit of this? And what am I teaching other people? about what it means to be successful or what it means to heal or be happy. And I think I'm very good at stepping away from all of that noise and going back to my values and making sure that I act from a place that truly does align with my core values, my deepest values, and that I don't mislead people. Because I know what it's like to be on the receiving end. Like I know how it feels to be on the receiving end. And I can also see other people performing. And it's not until we have those offline conversations where I'm talking about, you know, how how excited I am to be here and how, how much love I want to spread. And someone will turn around and say, so how much are you earning this month? Like it's, it's just a, re- and then I'm like, okay, I get it. This is the business side. So let's just carry on with the conversation. But then the whole conversation turns money orientated and it's about, you know, how you can keep growing and how you can reach more people. But it comes down not to reaching people because you want to help them. It comes down to reaching more people because you want to f- you want to fill your own ego you want to have a greater sense of self-worth and i think to myself i don't want to be that person i don't want to fit in a box i know people will label me this guru or this teacher or this spiritual author and you know for the sake of it i've called myself a self-love writer because all my teachings essentially come down to self-love but i don't i the, the labels aren't my own choosing a lot of the time you know they're how people sell me in the media, for example, or how people identify what I do. And I suppose labels provide clarity to people, but I, you know, I'm, I'm just this soul that's trying to make the world a better place. And I'm trying to show up as authentically as I can and the best way I know how. And that's not always perfect. You know, I'm a much better writer than I am a, a speaker. I'm a little bit awkward sometimes if I'm on TV or radio and, you know, that's just me. I'm not perfect. I, d- I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have all the answers either. Like I, 
I, even just the idea of being an expert, like I, you know, because I care so much, I research, I read constantly. But am I really the expert? I would say I'm more of a student than I am a teacher. So when someone calls me a teacher, I'm like, it sounds great. And I'm great. It's great that people are learning from me, but I'm also learning myself every single day. And I'm just trying my best. So I want to empower the world. I want to inspire people. But I want to do it in the most authentic way I can. And that's why I am authentically empowering. I thank you for being exactly who you are and exactly how you've explained that, because that's what we need more of. Thank you. And thank you for sharing those I ams. It's been a wonderful conversation so far. And we're just going to move on to your I have, which is I have plenty of wisdom from the adversity and heartache I have experienced. And you've kindly shared some of your experiences with us. And I wondered if there was anything you wanted to say about that. Yes, I think the thing that I really want to share is that through my scars, I've found strength. And through my wounds, I've found wisdom. But if anyone's going through a hard time, please don't feel the pressure to have to look for the lesson right away. Because I did that for a good part of my life. I, When I started reading books and I realized that there was this power to positive thinking, I knew I could use it to change my life. But what I did in that process was I neglected my emotions for the sake of being a positive person. And, you know, sometimes this gets packaged as toxic positivity. And someone's actually said I was one of the reasons toxic positivity emerged in the UK, which I don't agree with. But, you know, I've always tried to spread positivity. And I think authentic positivity can change your life. And I'm always going to be an advocate of that. If I started my journey in kind of the positive thinking at the age of 14 or 15. By the time I was 21 and 22, or 21 or 22, I think, I was in the worst place of my life. And that was, you know, I wasn't homeless. Um, I was experiencing some poverty, but not to the extremes I had when I was younger. But I was just completely depleted by life. And I had held on to all these negative emotions, I'd pushed them down as low as I could, pretending that they weren't there, that the things I'd experienced didn't matter, but they do. And only when you face those things can you create this real difference in your life. I wanted to, at that point of my life, I wanted to, I didn't want to be here. And it was the worst I think I've ever been in my life. It was my, I call it my ultimate low. And the fact that I, I I survived my attempt to leave the world and I was still here, I said to myself in that moment that I'm going to go on a different journey. I'm going to go on a journey of self-love because this whole positive thinking approach that I'm doing right now isn't working. I shouldn't be feeling this low. I shouldn't want to. I shouldn't have this desire to exit the world. I shouldn't be thinking those these things, but I am. And it, I'm thinking those things because I've just ignored... It's almost like self-neglect. I've actually avoided how I truly feel about about things, the experiences I've I've gone through. I've not made peace with them. All I've done is tried to 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 brush them away. And so I went on this journey of authentic self-love. I looked back on my trauma. I looked back on the things that I'd tried to hide away. And eventually I I found the lessons in those those things. But the key lesson that came from all of that was to not to 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 show yourself grace throughout your journey to hold self compassion because it doesn't matter what goal you aspire to achieve in life you have to have compassion for yourself the understanding the understanding that you you are just a human being that's trying to do their best in the world and that's one of the most important things for anyone listening out there yes you know your scars can be turned into your strength and Your wounds can turn into your wisdom and you can turn your pain into power and purpose. But please never neglect the series of emotions and the multitude of experiences that you go through in life. Because only when you face them and you really, truly make peace with all those things, can you find that strength? Can you find that wisdom? And can you find that power and purpose? that was beautiful and I really 
appreciate you sharing that experience with us and I know it will resonate with a lot of people who listen to this podcast so thank you I'm going to finish this podcast with one question that we ask absolutely everybody which is a little look into the future so we've talked about young vex and we've talked about the young vex that was also championing other people we're going to talk about vex in 10 years from now so if you could meet yourself 10 years older and have a conversation what do you hope that 10 years older vex would say to you that's a really great question i would hope that that vex in 10 years which would be 45 or 46 year old vex would turn around and and say to me you know well done for showing up as your true self especially in a world in a space where authenticity doesn't always reach the levels of success as maybe inauthenticity does, isn't always glamorized in the same way inauthenticity does. So well done just for really being you and inspiring people in a way that is authentically empowering. And the reason I say this is because it is extremely hard from my perspective when you've struggled your whole life, you've experienced poverty, all you've wanted to do is make, you know, provide security to your mum, because I, I, I saw my mum struggle my whole life. And all you've wanted to do is, is have security in life. And then to finally gain that security and make sure it doesn't slip away from you. It's so hard to say no to certain things, to these big deals, to these ways that might make me go against my own values. So I can have more and do more and be bigger and, you know, make more book sales or whatever it is. Like, it's extremely hard. I'll be completely honest with you, because those things are enticing a lot of the time. But I've held out. So if I hold out for another 10 years and I stay completely true to myself and I continue to inspire people as I wish to do, then I would deserve a big well done because... It is tough. It is tough. You can get lost in it. You can get lost in the voices around you. And I try to remind myself that actually, going back to what I said earlier, it's about people and purpose before profit and popularity. It's been such a joy to hear from you today. I have really appreciated your honesty, your authenticity and your willingness to share with us. It's been a pleasure for me. And, you know, it, the reason I feel, I think, so welcomed to, to, to be vulnerable and to share so authentically, authentically is because you've invited that in. So, you know, thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you, Vex. Oh, thank you.